What if I were to suggest that you play a key role in the awakening world? And that you are watching this because you have heard the call. We can start right now by opening our hearts and minds. Welcome to the awakening world. Good morning, everybody, and a very happy Sacred Sunday to each and every one of you. A question, are you an earth angel? Meaning, are you someone that's highly sensitive that sometimes you're wondering, what am I doing on this crazy planet? Where sometimes the density of this world is hard to bear? Or are you or someone you love a warrior angel? that at some time in your life, you wanted to protect your country or protect your family and went to war, either actual real war or maybe war with a government agency or war with a neighbor in your desire to protect. This morning, we're gonna have a very powerful show where we're gonna talk about being an earth angel and also talk about being a warrior angel and there's an amazing covenant that has been formed that, that we hear about for the very first time today. Uh, we have two of my absolute favorite guests. Um, Kristen Hoffman is with us. Um, and of course, Kristen is who narrated that opening video that you just saw. And one of our absolute favorite, she's a co-host of the show frequently. Um, and of course, an amazing news. And we have our beloved brother, Chief Phil Lane, who's with us. Um, uh, so it's beautiful to that. And of course, we have Brother Omashar. Um, so we're going to have music from Omashar and from Houston. And we're going to meet a new gentleman, uh, Andrew Mars, who is a former Green Beret and um, Special Forces, who has also gone through an incredible transformation and actually co founded the Warrior Angel Foundation. So that's what's happening today. Now, I want to start by inviting everyone to get ready to ask questions because we are going to have an interactive time today. And I want to welcome all of you, of course, who are on our Zoom. I see so many of our favorite family and friends. And I also want to welcome those of you that are watching on YouTube. Uh, thank you to Alan Steinfeld, who always carries us up in your realities. Uh, Sheila Seppi, who was on the show last night, who's got the Conscious Awakening Network. and John and Summer Raymer, who get us out to over 100 people um, through the sign network to Facebook. Now, if you're watching this on Facebook or YouTube or Conscious Awakening Network, I want to invite you to join the Global Peace Tribe. Um, and it's really easy to do that. Just go to globalpeacetribe.com, globalpeacetribe.com, and click register for the new season. And you'll get the links to all of our shows for the next three months. And for anybody who doesn't know this, we do three or four shows every week, all live, original content with amazing, inspiring people. For example, this week on Wednesday night, we, we do a show on Wednesday nights now. Um, it's a beautiful show with a new partner, uh, the people with Unite.Love, and a powerful group of people. 
last night's show, all about ancient galactic wisdom, and it blew everybody's mind. Uh, a remarkable group of leaders in the field of awakening and understanding about our galactic family. And then, of course, here's today's show where we're honoring warrior angels and earth angels. Uh, so uh, join the Global Peace Tribe. You'll get the links to all of our shows and access to all the recordings of our past shows. So come on in and join us. That way you're in the Zoom room. We can chat with you. We can take your questions. It's going to be a very interesting show. All right. I, we always, on the Sacred Sunday show, we always start with prayer. And nobody gives prayer better than she, Phil Lane. Uh, so, Phil, you know how much I love you. And thank you for being with us today. And I know you've got some really extraordinarily powerful information to share today. But would you please uh, get us off to a start from here? Yes, and thank you so much, Brother Scott and my, my dear Toja. Kristen, so nice to see you. And all the beloved relatives who have joined us. Creator of the universe, most beloved one, all powerful one, most kind one, most compassionate one, ever forgiving one. O ancient of days, O blessed beauty, we call upon your holy power to infuse us with your wisdom and understanding and detachment from all things save that which is love and kind and compassion, kindness and compassion. Wakanda, God, creator of all good things, we just give thanksgiving to be surrounded by our ancestors who are closer to their closest vein, who are praying for us when we pray for them on this beautiful, beautiful Sunday, this beautiful sacred day of all seven sacred days. And we ask with great thanksgiving for all the gifts that have been given from all the tribes and nations of the east from where comes the sun, red sunrise, and might come together in unity and harmony. At the south, where comes new life, they might come together in unity and harmony and stand with strength together, one heart and one mind in many bodies. We call upon all the tribes and nations of the west from where comes thunder, lightning, and rain. We give thanksgiving for those sacred elements that awaken and give nourishment to our Mother Earth, our sacred water. In the Kashiwa Kantaga, we give thanksgiving to all the tribes and nations of the north from where comes the white snow, that purifying north wind. May it purify our hearts and minds so we might become free and severed from all Savior holy power. We give thanksgiving to all the masculine elements of life. And Creator, we ask forgiveness for utilizing these masculine elements more than they should, as it's brought us to almost the brink of destroying our human family and all life upon Mother Earth. And we humble ourselves before our beloved Mother Earth, the water of Mother Earth, and womankind, and those spiritual qualities that different cultures call in feminine and masculine in different ways. We understand that those feminine qualities have been really oppressed for so, so long. But may they flower in all of us because we know, we know it's through these qualities of kindness and gentleness and the capacity to regenerate, to recreate life itself. And through these sacred powers, we will come together and have peace on earth by 2030. And creator of all good things, especially we ask this day to please remember all the children have no food and water today. And as we sit here every second, 40, 40 human beings are starving and dying from hunger, starvation. So we pray for those without water, without food, those in our penitentiaries. We sit there in the penitentiary this day in orphanages, children who are being enslaved, women who are being enslaved and traded like, like commodities. We pray for those animal relatives who are in this factory farming who are dying in horrendous ways. That we might live, but at the same time we ask Creator that we find a way to respect and honor all living things as we did in the past, that we only take more than we need. 
we can come back to that place where we really truly understand without question the prior unity and oneness of human family. Oh my God, oh my God, unite the hearts of thy servants and reveal unto them thy great purpose. May they fall in thy commandments and abide in thy law. Help them, O God, in their endeavor and grant them strength to serve thee. O God, lead them out of themselves and guide their steps to the land of knowledge. Here they are at their helper and their Lord. May thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. May peace prevail on earth. My names are Shukmano and Shinupasapa, and I stand fully responsible before the Creator for my words and my actions. How me chante washte Bhava Dekshi, whenever you are in the room, I just feel so many angel guides present mm -hmm. and just really feeling that now. And let's just, without saying too many words, deepen into this prayer space through the vehicle of music. May I be a vessel for divine love, connection, our highest collective spirit coming together. This will be, this will be a solemn journey. So this piece, I like to say, is being co-created <clears throat> by all of us here and all in the unseen realms. May we tune deeper into our hearts, call in our guides, and I want to specifically focus our energy on tuning in and activating the light grids on this beloved mother planet Earth. So as I'm playing, just feel the connection of golden white light moving from heart to heart to heart, and then visualize the light grids of life force energy highest love and protection glowing and reconnecting on this planet okay here we go
reaching out to all the hearts on this sacred mother earth. And all hearts connecting deep, deep, deep into her heart. See the light grids re-illumined, reborn into this moment, this sacred mission. Before we um, meet Andrew and hear Phil's story, I just want to ask you, because I know that most of the people that watch our shows, most of the people that I have come to know through the Global Peace Tribe are, are Earth Angels. And because I was married to one, I learned a lot about it by being married to Suchi. And I learned how hard it can be. And... Do you have any advice for when, how do you manage when the, when the horrors of the world, when the density, when you're really feeling it, how do you manage that? How do you manage to stay connected to source and to stay in a state of love mm. when circumstances are so difficult, Christian? Mm. Well, I think that for me, balance is always a key word and establishing a really deep inner dialogue. And I don't, and, and also just letting ourselves be with the world in whatever, allowing, allowance, balance, and deep inner dialogue. Because sometimes things are so overwhelming and we do go on that wave and, and suddenly we realize, oh, wow, I'm such a sensitive being and I'm, I do need to also mind this body, this spirit, and what I'm here to do. And so I think it is important, yes, to tune in to the world and take the pulse of the world and then be in that deep inner dialogue with yourself, with your heart, with your mission and call yourself back, take breaks from, you know, zooming in and out is very good. Sometimes we are, are, it is important to tune into the macro field and really observe the macro. And sometimes we really need to zoom back in to the micro of our own experience so that we can give our gifts and make a difference. And I truly feel that we can, we can't, ever solve everything and that i don't think is our mission what we can do is do our best to stay in balance with ourselves so that we can offer in our own way with our own unique gifts um our 
our tune, our melody to this planet. Mm -hmm. And as we interweave with others doing the same, I think we call in a higher vibration, a higher healing on this planet. It is not, I'm very clear, it's not my job to solve it all. And I have to really be in a space of compassion with myself when my heart wants to just uh, figure it all out or when I'm just taking it all in and it's so painful. Sometimes actually in the last couple of weeks, I had to check myself mm -hmm. because I realized, oh, my body is not holding all of this um, all of my sorrows around the world in a, in a good way. And not that we have to hold it in a good way, but I realized, oh, my body's not feeling uh, balanced. I was starting to get sick more than, than usual. And I really had to have a check-in with myself. What, would it, what does it take now in this moment to come back to myself and ground myself with this planet? Nature, I think, is so important for Earth Angels. So whether you live in a city or whether you live in the woods like I do, going outside, finding a park, going for a walk in nature, to me that is the best and quickest way to rebalance. Going out into nature, being quiet, and just tuning into the inner prayer and knowing that that is rippling out and that that we are doing our parts the best we can at any given time. So that's kind of my answer in a nutshell, but there's, you know, it's always changing. It's a difficult, it's a difficult dialogue. And sometimes we do get overwhelmed. Thank you for the beautiful, honest, you know, how you deal with it. And I, I want to read a couple of the comments and then um, we'll, we'll bring on Phil. Um, uh, Eleanor Joy writes, Oh, Kristen, exquisite and angelic. Now the tears are flowing with the beauty of you and your music. Um, Wanda writes, new mantra for me. I let go and expect the best. Reverend Jeffrey is recommending the arccrystal.com, um, which is beautiful. Ayata writes, Kristen, my eyes are brimming with tears. The power coming through your voice pierced my heart open even further. And I truly felt those celestial forces surrounding us, lifting us, holding us. We are so blessed to be together here today and every time on the Global Peace Tribe, sending love and gratitude to everyone here today. Reverend Jeffrey writes, Kristen takes me like no other to heaven. Eleanor Joy, as we get clear and honest with ourselves then that vibrates out to others sooner or later. Yes, Christian, brilliant response and sharing. Orgeen points out that she had to give up television 25 years ago and rarely ever watches the news in any way. I still find out what's going on by hearing others, but I meditate daily and also live in a rural area, deep breathing a lot and knowing I'm making a difference just by being myself. Final comment I'll read and then we're gonna to go to Phil. Kristen, the prayer, hear our prayer, has come through my lips countless times over seven and a half decades. This day, this time, with and through you, my heart spoke to source the grander. Oh, thank you so much, beloved ones. Wow. And like I said before we started on the song journey, we are, it is the collective shared field that experience was coming through from all of our heartfelt collective intention and so i'm not surprised that here our prayer came <laughs> through at the end i felt you and um what what an honor i at the very end of the sharing i could feel literally my heartbeat um mm -hmm. it was like a deep inner drum and I could feel it. I, I was thinking, wow, it really synced with all of your heartbeats. And it was so powerful for me. So thank you all for tuning in so deeply and co-creating that space with me today and with all of us. I'm putting the camera on Eleanor Joy for a moment just because your tears, Eleanor Joy, reflect, I think, I, I'm holding my tears back because I have to talk. But um, thank you for that represents, I think, how a lot of people feel. And I'm bringing Brother Phil back on because, Phil, you're an interesting dichotomy. 
because you are clearly an earth angel, but you also have been a warrior angel. You know both of those worlds. And honestly, most of the people I think in our show are more on the earth angel side. Not that many have gone to war, but you, you're in both worlds. You've got that understanding. And you and Kristen, I know, have a long history and friendship. But you also um, know the other side of being a warrior angel. And you have a very special soul that you um, are going to introduce to our Global Peace Tribe today. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. and I want to say that, that to my Toja, you know, I had tears too, because it's become so clear to me, just like our beloved mothers feed us through the umbilical cords into the womb world in which we grow our arms and legs and eyes and ears, preparing us for our journey into this womb world we live in today with our earth suits. It's so beautiful when we understand that the literal umbilical cord from the spiritual worlds beyond the world of time and space come through the arts and come through pure souls like yourself and whoever has purified their heart and mind. Because as our elders tell us, you know, may I become a hollow reed through which the pith of self has been blown. So I might be the source of the jo joyous melodies, awakening humanity to this new day, the day that shall not be followed by night, this new springtime. It's unfolding. So to the degree, you know, how we take care of ourselves, what we eat, you know, our compassion for others, our love, our forgiveness, which is really tough sometimes. But in those ways, we become that minaret of the creator's love and compassion. And that's what your music does. And it, 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 it does connect us and touches us in that sacred way. So I just thank you so much for that. And uh, yes, <laughs> as Brother Scott said, yes, I've, I've, I've played these, I've been a warrior in my life. I've been brought up in warriors. I remember hearing, which you know, I was less than 12, how my great-grandfather, uh, Bloody Knife, killed his first man when he was 12, when these other tribe came to try and take horses. He was responsible for that. And was even taught then, who did he shoot, who did he shoot first? And of course, they're, you know, they're running out in a line, so you pick out the last one. You know, so, you know, that's, that's how I was raised, raised by uh, my father telling me many stories of sitting all winter long with my great grandfather, Tipi Sapa, and, and Joshua Lodog. Lodog fought the little bighorn. And them sharing this story about the little bighorn, you know, and how the, the gunfire started like this. And, you know, hearing these stories, you know, you know my name when I was 12 was after, if I was a good boy for, for long, many months, my dad said he'd get me a, give me a name. So we had to go up horseback way up on the standing rock. Uh, my dad was born in Wakpala, and there was an old grandfather there. His name was Chantewashte, Strongheart. And when I was gassed from fighting with the Germans, he was about six feet tall. I don't know how he knew we were coming. My dad always said, Phil, how did he know we were coming? Putting that understanding in my mind that things go on beyond, beyond the world of time in words, beyond syllables and sounds and the murmur of souls and sounds of the world of names. So we went and sat there and his son had come with me to take my dad and I up horseback. And we sat there, we sat there. Um, anyway, he passed on his name to me, which is Shukmano. Shukmano in short means horse thief and long for it means a leader of warriors who takes the enemy's best horses. And so how I look, uh, of course, when I hitchhiked to New York and I was 18, I traveled around for a year. They thought I was, when I was in Italy, they thought I was Italian. I could go into, uh, when I went to Israel, I could tell I was, at, I could be kind of a, a Palestinian or Israeli. I could be Spanish. I could be all these different things. And except I couldn't do so in Africa or when I worked in Asia. But, you know, I tell you, I, I carried within me this anger and this hatred you know, that came from my being born in Indian boarding school at Lawrence, Kansas, and my you know, background that went on. And so, you know, um, 
every time I went in a wrestling mat, I mean, I imagine that was George Armstrong Custer against me. And I hated the military. I mean, not the military because we served in the military tremendously. In fact, a greater percentage of service in the military, U.S. military and Canadian military has been indigenous people per, 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 per capita by far. Getting clear back in World War I, we weren't even, we weren't even citizens. You know, we still, because we, we, we trusted our, our, I mean, we, we, when we make an agreement, we make an agreement and we said we'd protect this land. And so, yes, I've, I've had that part. In fact, that hatred and anger took me to winning the U.S. Canadian championships up here in Vancouver, Vancouver during this big invitational meet to going down the tube, alcohol, drugs, and healthy relationships, you know, because you can't hold that anger and hatred inside you. It eats you up. It will kill you. And so then, you know, I had this spiritual experience back in March 19. 67 and i begin my slow but sure journey on i'm not any saint or anything like that but i really believe with all my heart and soul that we have the capacity as a human family to let go of the past and step forward into a great future and i had the great honor of meeting a wonderful wonderful uh i call him toja nephew he's, he's younger than i and he calls me that she uncle uh in this in, in a spiritual through a spiritual visionary process, we we found out about this great run that was taking place down in outside of Houston, Texas, next to the Sam Houston National Forest, called the four by four by forty eight run. That means you run four miles every four hours, a total of forty eight hours, forty eight miles in forty eight hours. Pretty tough. And, you know, through this Dr. Sam, this other good brother of ours who's working with healing. This is all about healing. How do we heal the hurt and shame and, and, and our self-hatred, you know, for all the things we've gone through and all that have gone through us for seven generations before? We know that. And so I, this, this brother and, and all these special forces veterans, they were seeking the same thing, healing, healing. And so... Uh, I just, I'd like to, to introduce you to Andrew Marr, uh, who's here. Uh, I saw him in there. <laughs> Let me see. Yeah. Hey, hey there. Hi there, Chief. Hey there, Toshka. Hi. And um, uh, so nice to see you. So nice to see you. And so we were drawn, drawn down to bring a, bring a, our dear uh, grandmother, Mona Palaka, uh, 13 grandmothers, Austin Nunez, who's one of the chairs of the you know, Otto Odom Nation. Uh, you know, the whole team came down because we we're drawn by the spirit of what was happening there. And also, we knew that there had to be a time of coming together, that, that only through peace and only through truly recognizing the prior unity and oneness for human family, we're going, we're going to fulfill the sacred prophecies. And so uh, this is Brother Andrew, for some call him brother, I call him Toshka. You know, Toshka would be really helpful, you know, to, to take us back to, so we can understand, you know, you, you have served uh, the United States and, 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 and others, but with others that were there at the run, and you are the most highly trained uh, people for war in the world and and so people kind of think well, was he born to be wanting to kill people or whatever kind of share the story of how you grew up a little bit and and why why it was that that, that you wanted to serve this nation as you did and suffered tremendously and saw you, you saw men and women that you were responsible for die and you suffer terrible wounds and so forth. What, what, maybe get a little bit of background about you so we can, they can understand it. Most people would never get a chance to, to have it this visit like this. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Chief. I just want to say, everyone, it's a, my honor to be on here to speak with all of you. Kristen, thank you so much for what came through you. I'm really connected. Uh, I feel connected. To you, to everyone on this call, deep connection. I feel connected. I saw the grids of light emanate and come alive with more power than I've seen in some time. So I uh, just wanted to speak of gratitude and thanksgiving for that. 
you know, every day uh, I wake up and I attempt to remind myself and I start with this and it's that I'm certain that I live in the peak state of highest purpose and fulfillment that can only be realized in the love and gratitude that's found in contributing and performing to the best of my abilities in the service of others. That every thought, emotion, action, means of communication would elevate not only myself, but everyone I come in contact with. I earn it every day. This I am certain. And I would say, uh, Brother Scott, you talked about what do you do when you kind of overcome with so much is hard to handle. I just simply attempt to remind myself of who I am and what I'm here to do and what can I control as opposed to what I cannot control. And uh, I don't know if that's always helpful, <laughs> but it does seem to ground me back into, well, what can I do? What can I focus on as the next action? What attitude do I want to embody as I attempt to move forward in the highest and best way that, that I know how? And so with that, my background is born in Texas, Dallas, Fort Worth area, one of four boys and uh, grew up uh, where athletics uh, ruled. All I ever wanted to do uh, from the age of 10 was play football. So all my time and my effort, my energy uh, was spent there. Uh, I was athletic prior to that, but that was took me to, to another level. And I found this singular focus where I knew that that was the path that my life was supposed to be on. And that took me all the way through a, a very successful college career, successful high school career. Uh, in Texas, we won two state championships on my football team. I was one of the highest, highest recruited athletes in the state. I broke my leg my senior year and uh, actually cost me that uh, to be able to play that senior year. And many thought I would never be able to come back and play again but I was able to rehabilitate uh, and earned a scholarship two different times to two different universities. Uh, started all four years, had high aspirations to go to the uh, NFL. Again, my senior year, I had another back injury and uh, it became clear that that, uh, that road was ending for me. And that was probably the first time in my life that I had a real crisis of identity uh, as I wasn't sure how I was supposed to move forward when you feel as if the thing that you were put here to do, your reason for being, can no longer be embodied. And so that was a difficult process. But then uh, I just moved. This was 2006 that I graduated with my undergrad. And I really felt a strong calling to the military. Now, uh, unlike Chief Phil, I didn't come from a military family. Uh, but I did come from a patriotic family in the sense that my mother really instilled in us the burden of freedom and the burden of responsibility. And uh, she tried to express that the best way she could. And in 2006, uh, my understanding of the things that were going on in the world, I thought the best place for me was to, to serve, to serve the country and to do what I thought was the right thing and go and fight what to me was evil. And so that was that strong calling to put me uh, in there. I did my research to try to understand uh, all the different factions of the military. I uh, studied the, all the different special forces elements. And I found that the special force Green Berets uh, was something that resonated most truest with me. So that's where I spent my next uh, 10, 10 to 12 years. Again, I went from being an athlete, singular focus, and this, this has been a, a narrative throughout my life. I was just an extremely focused uh, individual. So when it shifted, all my life became around being the best I could be in the realm of special forces, to be the best combat leader that I could be, to put my men in the best positions that they could be, to evolve them, to mentor them, to grow them, and for us to be successful in our mission, and most importantly, 
to bring everybody back home to their loved ones. See, it's a it's a different game that you play there because the mistake anyone makes at any given time can not only cost you your life, but more detrimental to the warrior is a mistake that could cost the lives of your loved ones to the left and to the right of you. So it's an incredible burden and sacrifice and a privilege uh, of service because this service, it is a burden, but it's also a privilege that we get to uh, embody when we take on that mission. I'm gonna have to grab a sip of water, guys, one second. So I was in constant combat um for a number of years and so we would go so we have a very what we call fast and uh, operational tempo so we would go to a combat zone uh for six months usually entrenched in uh severe you know hand-to-hand -hand, uh close quarters combat and then uh come home from a period to for three to six months which we weren't really home we were out in the world training and um sharpening our skills and our skill sets and then uh to go right back into the a combat zone and that was a that was how i lived for 10 years and many of my generation uh, lived that way for the 20 plus years that we were in combat and no time in the history of mankind have we endured combat uh, this long this prolonged uh with this uh pace and rhythm uh ever especially we talked about the type of weapon systems and the uh, explosions that uh, people are in and around. And with that, I was in a lot of explosions and it's hard to quantify that to people who aren't in that realm. But one of my specialties uh, was called a breacher, an explosive breacher. So what I would do is I was able to put an explosive charge on like a, a point of entry. So somewhere that we wanted to get into that we didn't have access to. We didn't have a lock to the uh, key to the lock. Um, so we would put that explosive charge, say on a door, and get what we would call a, um, a minimum safe distance away from that, uh, would blow that explosive charge and then go in to do the job that we were tasked to do. So to become proficient in something like that in a combat scenario, all right, you have to do like anything else, you have to practice, you have to do it over and over and over, it comes from thinking to into being being into doing so it doesn't come to, to have to think about it anymore it becomes second nature so you need to do that at night you need to do that in rain you need to do that in snow you need to do that in every type of condition to be truly proficient and show and exert a level of mastery over that skill set so to do that we were in and around explosions all the time over the course of my career i was in more than 1000 close explosions now, we didn't really know it at the time, as counterintuitive as that might sound, but those explosive blast waves are extremely detrimental to the human brain. So when you have an explosion, it propagates this amount, a, a massive amount of energy, and that flows out in a 360 degree radius. And what happens with that energy is it comes through, the brain is floating in cerebral spinal fluid water inside the skull, and it literally hits it with such an amplitude of force that the brain is smacking back and forth against the skull, left to right, front to back. Now, by definition, every time the brain hits the skull, that is what we call a traumatic brain injury. Uh, you might hear the word concussion. Now, here's, here's what's different. Now, I'm talking about the difference in, in mankind as of right now. Every That happens about one time every millisecond um so literally hundreds to thousands of times with one explosion the brain is uh, knocking back and forth against the skull now without any physical injuries on my body again i'm i'm a special forces green beret i have been uh, screened to ensure that i have a high level of intelligence that my fitness uh, level is off the chart that my ability to communicate, my ability to lead others, my ability to work in a team, my ability to maintain composure in the most dire of circumstance is all at the top 1% of 1%. All right. And that's been, the, uh, that has been historically, you know, accurate over, over my life. So again, I said, so I'm in all these explosions. There's no, there's no, I'm not missing an eye. I'm not, not missing a limb. I don't have a gunshot wound. And yet I come back from my last deployment in 2013 and my life slowly starts to 
fall apart and then slowly went to expeditiously. And what happened there was a result of all the physical injuries to my brain, which we thought was purely just manifesting as a, as a psychological or emotional wounds. And that has its part for sure. But this is really uh, what I'm hoping to do here is paint a picture of how I shifted and how it was necessary for me to walk the path that I walked to get to the manifestation of now. And so I started to endure the most difficult uh, experience uh, of my life. And that was the me losing essentially myself. So in a short amount of time, uh, I started to have all of these uh, cognitive issues. All right. So I started to be able to, to I started to lose my short term memory, was started to lose my ability to communicate and speak uh, common language, or I would go and say a word and something completely different uh, would would fill in the blank. And I would say, hey, pass me the cup. And it'd be like, hey, pass me those potato skins. It just, it doesn't make any sense in the context uh, that I was talking. And uh, my energy, high energy individual, my entire life to just completely took an out from under me. So, so much so I didn't have the energy to get up out of bed and face the, the day and do anything. And cognitive, diminishing cognitive skills led its way to start to have become with the emo great emotional distress and I started to encompass this severe uh, depression now at this point in my life I'm living my life's purpose I'm married to the woman of my dreams we had uh, four or five kids uh, at that time and I, in my mind I didn't have any reason to be just uh, experiencing this deep depression I say okay deep depression can you can you explain that to me it was like I woke up every day to find out that I was responsible for my team getting murdered the night before. And that was on me, which didn't happen, but that was a level of sadness that uh, I was encapsulating and experiencing every day. And that in itself was overwhelming. And I was unable to kind of break from that negative energy that just seemed to hover around me like a cloud at all times. Then I started to go into and have panic attacks. Now, to me, at this point in my life, a panic attack is a what I thought ignorantly so was a weak individual's uh, attempt to, to navigate life, emotionally weak, psychologically weak. And so I, I was just flabbergasted at how I could just be the strong individual and have these panic attacks. And it didn't matter where I was at. I could be at home in front of my children. I could be in public. I can be in our, our weight room. And when this came on, there was nothing I could do about it. There's like this, another incredible over uh, coming wave of emotion. And I would get this tunnel vision and go into very uh, shallow breathing. And, and then I would just start crying uncontrollably and nothing I could do to stop it. I was uh, a witness to this thing that I had no control over in my body. And it just kind of had to run its course. And uh, that's a very difficult process to navigate in and of itself. So as you can imagine, these things start to get very difficult to have any type of home life, much less a professional life. All right. So I'm having cognitive issues. I'm having emotional issues. I'm having difficulty of battling uh, depression and anxiety. And then the physical ailments started to come on and rather quick because of uh, all the blasts. I started to get these incredible uh, headaches that would turn into migraines. Um, and this was on now a daily occurrence. And these migraines are so bad that my bit, my vision would go into blurry into into double vision. And so now I can't even see straight. And um, because of the vestibular damage to my ears, my balance is off, and now I, I can't walk in a, in a straight line. And I attempted to do my best to hide all this for as long as I could hide it, but the anxiety and the depression was so overwhelming that I began to drink from the moment I I got up to the moment I went to bed and not because I was looking to have a good time. That was the only respite that I could find from this deep emotional sadness and these negative internal speak 
that I had never experienced before. See, a highly motivated, highly inspirational, highly encouraged individual, very positive self-talk. And I began to notice these thoughts that didn't seem to be my own. And worse than that, I couldn't do anything to confront them. And they were starting to take over the space of my mind to be the dominant force. And um, I remember my wife was nine months pregnant with our fifth child, uh, Jojo, who really took a strong connection and meeting meeting Chief Phil when he was here with us uh, last year. But uh, like I said, my wife was so pregnant that she said, like nine months, like we're going to go into the into labor any day now. And she was like, Andrew, can you just please keep your drinking down today? I'm not asking you to stop it, but can you keep it down? Because I'm afraid I'm going to go into labor. And there's not going to be anyone available to drive me to the hospital. And that wasn't a moment that I turned it all around for me. Uh, matter of fact, it, it, that didn't go well for her. Um, but we were able to get her to, to the hospital. Uh, our boy, Jace, was 13 months at the time. That's my oldest son. And uh, my kids were all born, born uh, when I was away in combat. And so uh, I didn't understand later the significant toll that that had taken on you know not only myself but my family and the rippling effects that that has on that to have uh, a father absent not only absent because he's doing his work but absent because he's doing the work that that is um, uh, very difficult uh, for the family to to accept especially when they didn't volunteer for it uh, as a ch- as children don't but so Jace was 13 months old and he had had a what it calls a lymphatic malformation. So he had this kind of genetic issue with his neck and he had gotten sick um, a few weeks uh, prior. And this lymphatic malformation swelled to about the size of a softball and it became extremely life threatening for him. We were in and out of the hospital. We had about six or seven different uh, surgeries. Finally, we had got him up to Seattle Children's Hospital. They were able to remove this massive growth that was there on his neck, literally the size of softball, collapsed one of his lungs. And uh, I'm, I'm dealing with all the things I'm dealing with, but I can tell you nothing is worse than watching your child suffer and not the child not know why that they're suffering. So we had to take him into the emergency room so it got so bad. Meanwhile, my my leg at this point, I'm having this tremendous, tremendous pain in my calf. And I I can't really uh, locate that. I'm I'm not sure what's going on there, but I can push through pain, not a big deal. So let's get my boy uh, to the hospital because because we're worried that he's not going to be able to breathe through the night. So we go in there. Becky's with me, my wife. She's nine months pregnant. Well, Becky goes into labor. Jace has to be rushed to the immediate, uh, the seventh floor of the uh, hospital there to go into emergency surgery. And uh, so I'm kind of going back and forth why Becky's given birth on the second floor. Jace is having surgery on the seventh floor. And the meanwhile, my, my leg stops working. So I literally have to drag my leg with me to get up and down the elevator and the flights of stairs. Now I'm drinking alcohol in these airplane bottles of whiskey because that's the only way that I can keep it together. And we're able to get Jace through his surgery. He's on the other side of it. Becky gives birth uh, to our our boy Jojo at that time, which I don't have really any uh, recollection of this time period. And then they were able to, after that, because I wouldn't accept any uh, care, they, they rushed me to get imaging on my leg. And what they found was that I had this massive blood clot in my leg that had broken off and had traveled to both lungs. So now I had what's called a bilateral pulmonary embolism. And they were like, you have minutes to live. And uh, at this moment, I, I'm, I'm laughing because I've, I've, I've looked at death so many times. It's a familiar state for me. And I said, hey, guys, if you think that this thing is going to be the one to take me out, that you're going to have to get in line because it's not happening. But um, all three of my Two of my boys and myself were all there uh, in the hospital in different scenarios to include Becky at the exact same time. So we were under a real physical and, and spiritual warfare there uh, on our front. I was uh, in the hospital uh, fighting for my life for the next uh, two to three weeks, thanks to the uh, modern uh, advancements in medicine. You know, I'm alive and well and kicking today. But that that was when I started to realize, like, man, um, the way that my life is going, I'm taking full responsibility for. And I sat around and I talked about how I couldn't believe what had happened to me, how I had lost who I was supposed to be. It was taken from me. 
just talking about and living in this victim mode, which is never a mode that I encapsulated prior to this point, but sometimes life throws its curveballs and it brings us to our knees, or we think it brings us to our knees or to our lowest point, but uh, there's usually an always more, both up and down. And our son, Jace, continued to have problems. We had to take him to Seattle Children's to again, finally take this thing out of it. But it was at Jace's bedside when he is in um, the uh, ICU at Seattle's Children after he just was recovering from this uh, surgery. And I remember looking down at my son and I had this uh, epiphany that my life was at this crossroads. And I realized if I was gonna continue on that same path, that for sure it was gonna end up in a premature death. Not a big deal, but what, really mattered to me about that was having my son, Jace, who I was there as bedside born. And I remember the day because I was in such severe combat. And I remember just praying to the creator. I was like, if I could just meet my son, I would just be so grateful because on that day, I wasn't sure that we were going to uh, make it out of the situation that we were at. And, and, and to realize that I had gotten to where I was at and that my son could lose me because not of a combat scenario, but simply my life falling apart. Um, it didn't. It didn't sit well with me. And so, like I said, worse than that, it was going to ruin or play a significant part of damaging my children's life, my family's life. That was no longer an option for me. So, right there at my bedside, I made a promise to my son and to myself, and it was a three-part promise. Number one was that I would return to the man of my pre-injury status. Number two was I would find a way to come off all the medication they had put me on, which made me ma massively worse than when I started on this path. And when I started, I was a wreck. And in my mind, those two things had become non-negotiable. I didn't care what mountain I had to climb, what door I had to knock in, what wall we had to go over, how much money it cost, where we, uh, how, where we had to go, what anybody had to say about it, because it was a done deal. My mind was made up. And after those two were accomplished, number three was I was going to turn around and I was going to spend the rest of my life helping out other individuals just like myself get on the other side of the trauma and the medical system that they were having to navigate because I saw how detrimental that was to my community. We have record numbers of suicide in the military, even more specifically so in the special operations units. Now that's shocking when you understand that these individuals are assessed and selected for having a certain psychological disposition that makes them um, enhanced as opposed to uh, the rest of civil society and to take on these highly stressful conditions. So it was shocking to think that these war fighters who were paid to make difficult decisions in life and death situations thought the best option for them was to take their own life. But it wasn't until I fell and hit rock bottom until I understood how that was because I had a gun in my mouth many nights that I thought I am causing so much pain and damage to my family, the only option that I can see that's going to benefit them is if I cease to exist. So that path sent me on the healing path. And I started to go all over the countries and really learn more about the brain and learn what I could do for myself. Because we were told, hey, all you can do is take this pharmacology and try some psychotherapy, which did nothing to improve how I was doing. So because of that pathway, I was able to find one of the premier neuroendocrinologists out in Los Angeles. And he found a way to identify exactly what was going on in the brain, to use natural remedies to bring my own internal system back online, because that's what had happened, because there's such damage to my hypothalamus and my pituitary gland. I was no longer producing the chemistry that's necessary to run the body the way it's intended to be run. Nobody ever looked or talked about those things. So identifying and finding that on turned a new light bulb on in me. I was able to get back on this personal protocol that returned me to the man that I was before all these explosions. And so to be forced to be medically retired from the army, pushed out on the streets, given a bag of double digit medication saying, hey, thanks for your service, but we can no longer use your highly advanced skill set to I'm off on my medications. 
I'm symptom and medication free, and now I'm performing as good, if not better, than my pre-injury status. My brother and I co-founded our organization, the Warrior Angels Foundation, to help other service members and veterans who are struggling with the unforeseen physical injuries of traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress. Where we were able to bring this advanced and uh, highly beneficial and, and natural remedies to our warriors who are not getting even the understanding that an alternative existed. So now today in 2023, we've now brought this uh, level of healing to our community more than, I mean, thousands of times, thousands of times with similar and repeatable results just like my own. So it doesn't matter. Nobody has to take my word for anything. We have a mount, all the science backs it up. I don't really go down that route, but we can. And, but the evidence speaks for itself and the lives change speaks for itself. And before we were told this lie that it could only be done this way, but it's not true. And we were told that you couldn't come back and be who you were before, or you can't be better than you were before. And that's not true. So we're helping others to actualize their potential and we've been doing that now for some time. In 2016, August 6 of 2016, I kind of had my first, um, I would say, massive spiritual uh, awakening. And I got into this visionary uh, state where I relived a lot of my combat experiences, but from a higher platform of perception, if you will. And so I could see things not from my own point of view, but more from a 360 above point of view. But not only could I see it and experience it, I could feel it from, from multiple um, perspectives. And I realized at that moment that there was things psychologically, spiritually, that were clogging me up, that was keeping me from being, the playing the highest note that I could know. And it was by going back and reliving these experiences and being able to reframe it from a low level of meaning to a very high level of meaning for me personally, that I was able to break free of those chains that it had on me. And I was able to, to speak with the dead. I was able to mourn with their parents. This is in the spiritual realm. And this allowed me to really understand the burden that I had volunteered for the burden of service and the burden of sacrifice and how that now mission was just being transformed and elevated to a different level. And it was everything that I had done to get me to that point was necessary. And it was good because it brought the manifestation of now. And in the now moment, I understood the past. And I understood that even though I couldn't change the past, I could change the influence of the past in the now moment to make it a different future that I wanted to see, the future where I could play the highest note that I could know, to hope that that light that could now emanate more strongly through me could simply reach out and resonate and be seen by others who maybe had it turned down a little bit, and they saw and recognized something that was in themselves that was turned down. In that spiritual visionary quest that I was on, once I relived all these different traumas, I connected to the still point, to the zero point field, to source itself, where I was, there was no self. Everyone here I can feel knows what I'm talking about. There was no time, there was no space, there was no past, there was no future, there was just pure actuality in this field of emanating intense love. I don't know how else to explain it, but in this state of pure awareness and love that was intelligent and that was growing, wasn't changing, it's dynamic, I understood for the first time, I think in this body form, of the interconnectedness of all life. I hear Chief Hill say it all the time, the hurt of one is the hurt of all the triumph of one is the triumph of all. You really have to understand our connection to each other, that there is no division, there is no separation other than what we create in the mind, but that was experienced in real time. I don't know how many lifetimes I spent there, but it, you know, in the earthly realm, in linear time, it was probably about 20 or 30 minutes. But I remember coming back to my body, um, 
And as you all know, when you have an experience like that, you're forever changed in an instant. You can never go back. There was you before that, there's you after that. And I came back and I, I had this better understanding of who I was, of who everybody else was. And you see the separation start to evaporate. And you see the connection of all life now and through your everyday waking consciousness and, and eyes. And so since that moment in 2016, we've then kind of been elevating what we were doing with our clinical, clinical work to also um, bring this level of understanding and healing to those that could benefit from it uh, to have these same experiences. So we do our best to actually heal, heal the brain, heal the body. We don't heal anything, but give, um, give the tools for, but see the body has this incredible intelligence. It needs the right environment and it can heal itself. So we support the environment for the brain and body to become optimized again. And then once we do that, we can help uh, others through um, these incredible molecules to also have the same type of spiritual awakening if they so choose. And so we've been on that journey since 2016. We played a major role in uh, the new legislative efforts, both in the federal and state level to bring these uh, psychedelic uh, molecules and compounds uh, out of schedule one and, and into clinical uh, use. We've done a lot of work here in, in Texas. I say a lot of work now with the, with the current administration. And uh, we got uh, legislation in about 13 different states to do new studies and new researches on these psychedelic uh, compounds. Um, we're doing a major work now with the state of Texas. They're gonna support our TBI program, which is also gonna bring our veteran population on our ranch here that Chief was a part of uh, to be able to administer these healing modalities uh, to our veterans. Because as it was shown to me, this vet veteran population is very important. They know how to organize. They know how to be a part of something bigger than themselves. They know how to sacrifice. Uh, a lot of them will come to the awakening that they had that I was um, used at somebody else's uh, meaning um, uh, to awaken to um, it, it was a lie. It wasn't, it wasn't something that really needed to happen. It was to pet perpetuate current states that are just trying to self propagate and do, do more of that. So what I'm saying is, is we're awakening to our new mission, our new purpose. And that is to create this new earth, this higher note, this understanding of the interconnectedness of all of life. And that was that brought us back to our event that we had last year, which was called the 4x4x48. Four by four by we brought in all the special operations warriors uh, all throughout the, the country. And we have people come from all over the world to participate uh, in this event. Okay, and say, okay, well, what, what's the big deal about that? So you, you want to run or walk four miles every four hours for 48 hours. Okay. It was much greater than that. It was to bring in all of the warriors, all of the leaders from my community, from the special forces community, for us to share sacrifice together, to remember, to remember the ones that we were with that never made it home, to celebrate those who came back and reintegrated into life and were doing good and to recommit ourselves to the people that have came back but have yet to return home. It was to remind us that we're on the path to bring everybody home if they so choose to, but we're going to walk in that light. We're gonna walk into our values. We're gonna walk in our virtues. We're gonna walk in honor. We're gonna walk in dignity. We're gonna walk in compassion. From this moment forward, unified. And that's the covenant that we make. And that's how the spiritual elements brought Chief Phil to us somewhat miraculously, and he understood what we were doing and the spiritual component of it. And Chief Phil brought from his community everybody that would listen to him uh, to the to our property to pray for the warriors, so we could take part in uh, community and ceremony together at the culminating event. We had a staking ceremony, which every warrior then made a covenant between the creator and themselves that we were unified, that where the indigenous and the military were at war with each other before, that that was gone. The division was gone. The inaccurate narrative was gone. And that we were unified 
as one people. And the goal is simple, to do our best with every moment that we can. And that when we get knocked down, we're going to get back up. And not only are we going to get up, we're going to put a hand out to our left and hand out to our right and to bring our brothers and sisters up with us and move forward in love and unity simply because that's what we want to see. I'm not attempting to change the world. I'm attempting to be the best I can be. And hopefully that has a positive influence on the people around me. I think the secondary effect of that is the world changes. But that for me is not the end state. I simply want to create this environment for myself for my family, for my loved ones. And we want that to ripple on. So I've been just babbling and babbling and babbling, but yes, Chief Phil kind of asked me. I'm going to come in for a moment because your story yeah. is incredible. And we do need to yeah. digest. <laughs> okay, we need a little digestion time. Um, I want to read a couple of comments that have come in because this is part of what we do on Global Peace Tribe. We like to include our audience. And then we're going to actually go to Omashar because when we have somebody as incredible as you are, sharing as much as you have, it's a lot to digest. And we digest through music, right? So I want to read a comment. Then we're going to go to Brother Omashar for some music. And then we're going to come back and um, learn a little bit more about this sacred covenant um, that you and Phil are doing. And we're going to do a second follow-up show on February 4th. We'll talk about that. But here are a couple of comments. Um, uh, from Karen Eisenberg, Andrew, your heart life calling is supporting so many and bringing our lights all together to heal all in our new world. I hold so much admiration for all that you were doing. Um, Bonnie wrote through her, uh, her husband, um, Andrew, thank you. You have helped me more than I can express. You've helped me understand my disabled brother, who is a Purple Heart Vietnam vet who experienced forehead injury that almost took his life. He has no short-term memory after the loss of his frontal lobe, but the trauma went so much further than I ever knew until I heard you speak just now. Dia writes, great spirit has heard my prayer, Andrew, and has spoken through your presentation. I'm at the pinnacle of head pain schizophrenia that I'm fertile ground to go after the help you were presenting. I've been on this journey for many years, namaste. Jennifer writes, you fought hard to bring this important message to us today. Thank you, Andrew. Morgine writes, thank you, thank you, thank you for helping those people who so need help. I am beyond words of gratitude. Krista writes, he's amazing. Yes, he is. Um, and so uh, there's more, but just uh, I have put into the chat box, but for all of you watching on Facebook, um, there is a beautiful and important film. Uh, now, what I'm on is the, the foundation that um, Andrew has helped to create, and it's called, the, there he is, the Warrior Angels Foundation. So for those of you watching on Facebook, just go to warriorangelsfoundation.org, warriorangelsfoundation.org, and there's this incredible film called Quiet Explosions, Healing the Brain. And you can actually watch the film by going to that website. And we're going to come back to Andrew and Phil and a few more comments. I'm going to hear from Krista and a few of our Earth angels. Um, to digest all of this, I'm going to go to beautiful brother Ramashar. Thank you. Lift it. 
so much from Ashar. Thank you. A perfect song for what well, Andrew. Thank you. I, Andrew, I feel so much power and I love and respect your spirit so much. And I just called for that. Thank you. You know, Andrew, um, my primary mentor in life was a man named Marshall Rosenberg. And my favorite quote from Marshall was the greatest joy in life is to be in service and create well-being for others. And I really want to acknowledge your commitment to that and the different places it's taken you. The, the heartbreak of not being able to go play in the NFL after preparing for that for so long and that seeming to be the clear goal. And then going and serving a patriotic duty under such extraordinarily impossible for any of us to imagine circumstances. And then to come out of it, and here you are, this brilliant top 1% of 1% mind in a beautiful, healthy body. And for that to be so damaged and for you not to, and for you to pull out of victim thinking, which would be, I'm sure, went on, to pull out of that and again, find your commitment to being of service to others. To find that beautiful commitment. It's extremely inspirational to us. Um, I'm going to read just two more comments, maybe three, and then bring on Phil for the two of you to share. Uh, Kiki writes, thank you, Andrew, for sharing your life journey. God bless you and family, and thank you for your service. I also have had a traumatic brain injury, and I can, can relate to some of those symptoms. Charlotte writes, Andrew, the fact your experiences have brought you to this place of conscious awakening 
and service is nothing short of a miracle. It makes me weepy to listen to you. I can only imagine the impact it has on those who have had similar experiences. Bless your work. You truly are an instrument of healing peace. Um, Ayata writes, Andrew, this was one of the most powerful sharings, teachings I have ever heard. I'm humbled, inspired, and blown away. So as you can see, you're touching our Global Peace Tribe audience deeply. We normally end the show at 1130. We can go like an extra 20 minutes, but because there's so much that you and Brother Phil have to share, um, Phil and I have decided we're going to uh, do a second part at a longer time on Saturday night, February 4th, um, uh, a week from last night, Saturday night, February 4th. We're dedicating the show again to understanding our warrior angels, understanding our earth angels, and understanding this covenant that I'm now going to bring uh, Phil on uh, to share with our audience about. So we'll keep it to about 10 more minutes today. Uh, close out with another song from Kristen, and then encourage everyone to bring your friends and family to Saturday night, February 4th, for where we can go deeper into uh, this incredible work. So, Phil, tell us about the covenant. Well, first of all, I want to say, Toshka, so thank you so, so much for the incredible, stirring, inspiring sharing you've given us. Because uh, to understand what's unfolded and what unfolded the 4th and 5th of March, 2022, it's so important to understand this history. And I just want to go back for myself. You know, so many things you said reminded me of my, my, my journey. But um, I'd already shared I was born in Indian boarding school and that I didn't share that I'm on my lineage side, my great grandfather, Tipi Sapa, Philip Deloria, was known as the primary spiritual leader across uh, the high plains there, um, a hereditary chief uh, who became later when the military uh, enforced the treaties that said we could not practice Roman spirituality, saw that the, the, the path forward was to, to uh, really... You, and, and really through a song he kept hearing every time he'd ride by this church, he knew that this path would be a path we'd have to take. So he became a Christian minister, at the same time retained his chieftainship. And for 40 years, he was the minister at the Sandy Rock Indian Reservation and traveled all over that area. And it was there, my dad was born. You know, my grandmother died when, from tuberculosis when he was five. So he had a lot of pain about that. Then, you know, he went, 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 lived with my Great grandfather who raised him gave him the name Matogi Brown Bear, named after a great great grandfather who who slayed the white buffalo. Was prophesied that foretold this coming of this this time that's coming, that we would have a responsibility to live through this and find others who had similar responsibilities to transform this situation we're in to peace, and um, and so you know this this journey. The last 55 years has been a has been quite a journey. Beginning really, really consciously back in 1970 when I went to travel to Bolivia, and there, um, as prophesied, I was the eagle that came from the north that fulfilled that prophecy in Jul July 9th, 1971 at Lake Titicaca. Many have come, and I didn't know at the time what was really going on, but that I can fast forward to to these last to August. Uh, to, uh, 2020. August 2020, I'll tell you, I was really, really suffering. I hurt my back riding a horse and uh, it was about 212. And, you know, healing since these last 55 years has been uh, a foundation of my life. Working, of course, uh, uh, through our film, uh, Healing That Hurts, we ignited the, the residential school issue here in Canada, which I was able to kind of be, be a, in a primary role because I had tenure at a university and I was able to say things and do things you couldn't without tenure because everybody's really, my dad said, you, it's very difficult to negotiate with people, give me money to negotiate. Anyway, 
So I knew that, that in order to come to that place where there'd be peace, we had to, as my grandfather, Vine Deloria Sr. told me, make allies. And so part of my life has been making allies. And it hasn't been an easy road, uh, especially in my own indigenous world, uh, when you're letter complected, even though Crazy Horse was letter complected, because you get it from those relatives who, who saw what, what's, what they saw betrayal by mixed bloods. In fact, they were interpreters, et cetera. So you get that part, oh, you're too light to be Indian and all that. On the other side, you, you hear and can witness things in other places of people putting down Native people or people say, oh, you can't be Indian or whatever. But the one thing, you know, that my father raised me to be is, he said, is, is to be ourselves. He used to say, he said, son, I was born wild. I'm going to die wild. I don't want any part of the two reparation age, two food loom underwear, diet Pepsi culture. And so I was raised by myself. And, and really felt like I was born and raised in a boarding school in a way. And, but I knew I was surrounded by love. And these prophecies, without question, told us that in time, in time, we have to keep praying. I remember one time I asked this elder, why aren't these coming true? <laughs> when are these prophecies going to come true? He says, you sure have a big ego. Why do you think they have to take place in your life? But they will take place without question. So I was at 212. Uh, and uh, through a series of visions and things, uh, I was told about this sacred medicine that was down on our home territory in Chickasaw Nation. And so I began this journey similar to, to, to my dear Toshika Andrew, and that is to really get down to heal some of this real deep trauma that I'd carried, even though on the surface, uh, I'd be fine. But if you hey, get me in and push my buttons, I could be still getting a pretty good fight. And that we want as an elder to be wise and loving that, that no matter what is said or done, you want to re respond to love. So I began this, this journey using sacred medicines. And um, by December uh, 2020, I'd gone from 212 to 157, 157 pounds. And uh, my life began to change and is still changing. In that process, in that process, we met a very beloved brother, uh, Dr. Samuel Lee, who in fact, right now in Thailand. And uh, there was just, it's hard to explain this, and, and we'll talk about it more. But one of the things that came to me uh, 41 years ago through a sacred, sacred process that happened with the loss of a life at Washington State Penitentiary of Leon Gaze and keeping a soul for one year as instructed by our white buffalo capitalist was the return of one of Crazy Horse's pipes that it turned, it occurred on December 29th, 1980, 90 year anniversary of the Wounded Knee Massacre. We've kept this very quiet because it was actually through uh, the Washington State Penitentiary and the brothers there and the prayers there that guided all these things to unfold, which, which uh, we'll share in a future time. But, but that pipe was so important in, 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 in keeping us going because we knew Tashunka Ko by the time he was 36, when he was assassinated, Fort Robinson had had delivered the U.S. military the greatest defeat ever before in history. With George Armstrong Custer, he also fought many, many times was undefeated. And so that that sacred pipe has been part of many, many prayers in many places um, to slowly but surely bring this unity. And of course, you know, even talking about it here, there'll be those relatives who say, "How in the world that he could the little short." guy that looks like he's Jewish or, or Spanish could end up with that sacred pipe. Well, it happens to be something we've kept, kept for my, over these years. And so I knew in my prayers, I could see this vision of coming together and what that would mean. And so through this way things happen, the sacred process, you know, I began to visit, have these visits with uh, Toshka, Andrew and Adam, his beloved brother, and we begin to share the foundation of, of a covenant, guiding principles, principles of consultation, uh, codes of ethics, a whole series, a whole foundation for rebuilding the union, the condor, the Quetzal, and the eagle, and rebuilding our, our relationships as human beings. And uh, so, and, and just, I know we have just a short amount of time here, but... I'll just put it now to Andrew. Andrew, 
how, how did this all come to you? Because I just knew that we needed to be there. And we, we, we made whatever arrangements we needed to be there. And we didn't ask for any resources. We took our resources as best we could, and we came. And what a time we had. What a time did we have when we came there. My gosh, I remember from beginning to end, you know, Mona, sacred, Mona playing with that sacred pipe and so forth. So how was it for you? You, you, here you are, here you are, here's a bunch of, a group of indigenous people coming. Uh, although you had your good friend, Dene Navajo brother, who, who'd been through the combat with you. I know he came. Uh, and we came to make this covenant. You went through and we went discussed all those things. We didn't get into the articles on the 16 uh, on the international treaty, but the preface, we were fine. What was your thoughts? I mean, yeah. you know, I, from your uh, side, we really discussed this before. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I will, I'm going to be brief and respectful of everybody's time. And I, I hope that uh, Chief Phil and I will fully be able to engage on this uh, next Saturday. Uh, I'll just say this. Um, it's one of those things you put something into motion and it starts to become more and greater than anything that you could ever hope for or imagine mm. and multiply that by a million or our, our infinity. And, and that's what it was for me from the very first opening ceremony. I spoke chief Phil spoke and mind you, this is the warrior class has come here on this ranch in the Sam Houston national forest to to sacrifice but we didn't i mean we shared chief phil was coming we didn't really share the spiritual component and we gave everybody the choice to opt in to you know the ceremonial processes that we were doing or they could opt out no pressure there but from inception the first word see the indigenous have the way of just grabbing and speaking to the warrior culture and they were locked in immediately and there was no questioning there was no what are we doing here what are they doing here? They immediately got it. It was unspoken, but it was known. That amplified, that magnified, that uh, expanded, evolved from that moment forward. And there was momentum growing, momentum growing, connection building, connection building, restrengthening lost ties, restrengthening lost bonds. And as we continue to go into the days and nights without sleep, continue to put our bodies to the test, our spiritual warriors were there singing, praying at all times for us. Everybody began to understand the significance of this event and that it was the unification, these two warring sanctions that were no longer at war and chose to be in unity. And that rippled across just the physical ties right there into the spiritual world into produced outcomes and effects that I can't quantify or completely understand, but it was as if these higher frequencies came in and they needed these people at a specific place and time to be able to hold those, to bring them and put them in the earth, to re-clarify and reunify on this vision of the future. I didn't know any of the prophecies. That's still not clear on all that. I just know what I'm supposed to do and the roles that we're supposed to play and what came from it. So in brief, Chief, that, that's what it meant for me, uh, positive change um, and actualization of what's supposed to be. Great. And I think, I think Toshka, thank you so much for all uh, that you shared and, and, and Brother Scott, you know, and Toja, Christine, Norma Shar, beautiful music just hit the spot one million percent. And so happy that you're, you're, you're kind of a visionary, Scott. Mm -hmm that kind of <laughs> but you see things and you saw that we needed to, to continue this because this is a very very important what's happened here it's been one year we took to absorb this to 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 reflect on this and now for the first time we're bringing this out never spoke about these things but what we have yet to share is even way more and what's the result of this is going to be way more so i just want to put it that much and i don't know if it's possible i know you're going to say it in a little bit late but i would just love to hear Take us out in one more song, Toja. Just lift my soul completely out of my body and let's meet over in some warm spot in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good to me. I love you, Dexy. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to have one. We are going to close with a Christian song. I do want to do two quick announcements first. Um, first of all, this beautiful uh, 
grandmother is going to be joining us on February 4th. So again, we're going to continue uh, this conversation with Andrew and she, Phil. And Phil um, has invited grandmother Mona Palaka. Uh, yes, yes. And, and that, is, that is Tashuka Wiko's pipe right there. She's praying, yeah. she's been praying with it for 40 years. Wow. Oh. And so we're going to, you know, hear more about that, see this video. Um, and this will all be taking place again on Saturday night, February the 4th. Um, and um, Kristen will not be able to be with us live on the 4th, but she's going to provide us. We've got some beautiful videos. And of course, Amushar will be with us. And we will continue this conversation about how we are unifying our human family, ending war, and we will have peace on earth by 2030. So definitely invite people on Saturday night, February 4th. There's one other really important announcement, um, and that's, um, I'm gonna bring Christy Michaels on for a moment. And Christy, we don't have much time, but tell us about uh, your very precious event that's gonna be happening on Tuesday. Thank you so much, Scott. Yes, we're doing the birth and the rise of the divine feminine and celebrating it because we we honor the divine masculine but nowhere do we have a celebration to the divine feminine and really with that we 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 at the global peace tribe are really committed to bringing forth the new earth but there's not going to be a new earth without the rise of the divine feminine because as was so beautifully it is illustrated by andrew is that connection to the divine that is so powerful and healing and, and we have in this world, to this day, 17,000 children a day are statistically still dying of starvation. And if you have the divine feminine emanated, the divine mother, the babies get fed in a culture where, where the divine feminine is embraced and women know who, the truth of who they are. We're 51% of the population, just a unified voice of women who know their divine nature and and are following the the guidance of the divine mother the babies would be fed we know how to feed the babies we know how to make that happen but we're not unified the we are losing our reproductive rights of uh, i just heard one of the top um you know what they call male influencers on the national platform just announced that he wished the that we could go back to burning women at the stake and he's putting that propaganda out there and so this is going backwards not forward so we have to raise up and acknowledge so Antoinette is joining me we've got some amazing people coming on it'll be a heart opening beautiful uh, a celebration of the divine feminine so thank you so much if you if you scroll down on that you would have seen all the people that are participating on that yeah, so we'll go one more just time. She's got scroll down just a little bit more. Dan LaPuma, Elizabeth Kelly, Carolina Michelson, Dan Morris. There's, there's a picture down below. Just yeah, there, there you go. Okay, absolutely. I was just reading it, dear. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a lot of uh, and of course, so many of these people honest to you that we've um, had on our Awakening World shows. So again, details are at gospel of Mary Magdalene.info gospel of mary magdalene.info and thank you for putting that on christy i know it's going to be a beautiful event yeah thank you so much for being such a support of all these divine pathways the the global peace drive rocks man <laughs> it's like that, that's what we need we're the ones we've been waiting for right and if we're going to make it happen it's going to be us taking a stand and saying no we want we want a culture of peace we want um women honored and respected and um so thank you so much blessings <laughs> i appreciate it christy thank you all right um well we're going to conclude with a beautiful beautiful song from christian i'll bring on uh, phil one more time yes. phil thank you so much for being with us today any final thoughts before we go to christian well i've just uh, put into the chat the actual covenant there's details. It's quite quite extensive. For those people who would like to read it, uh, we'll 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 when, when, on Saturday we're going to break out some footage and we'll make it really nice so that people can can see this. As we have now brought this to the Independent National Convention, it's gone to three of the six political parties 
uh, for the six political parties as a foundation for bringing about national unity. We have not yet got it to the Republican Democrat Party, which um, of course are united, but what I'm saying is what we are really looking for is we believe that adversarial partisan politics are destroying us and taking us down the tube. That we believe that this should be any kind of dialogue should be undertaken by the very covenant we made. So I'll just say that much and put that there. Thank you. And um, to those who are watching on Facebook, that's why it's best to always join the Global Peace Tribe so you can get all these links. Um, uh, so this is the covenant. Phil, somebody asked, can this be shared? Is this something yes, that can? Most certainly, most certainly. This is the time to share it. We've had a year of reflection almost. It's coming to a year. And now it's uh, it's there as it has been. All right. And it's it's a very important document. So everybody copy it. For those watching on Facebook, you can still have time to join globalpeacetribe.com. It'll take a minute. Register. And before Kristen's song is over, you can actually be in our chat box and get the link. Uh, otherwise, if you register um, afterwards, you can email us and we will make sure that you get all of these documents. Um, so thank you, Phil. Andrew, oh. needless to say, you have absolutely blown our minds today. Um, we so honor you and your commitment to service, your commitment to um, playing your role in life. And we look forward to learning more and, and spending more time with you on Saturday night, February the 4th. Thank you, everybody. It's been a real honor. All right. And to our Earth Angel, Kristen. Um, any, well, any it has been you want to share before you sing. Yes, I was going to say what a profound and deep talk. Re encoding us with our own possibility of healing on levels that I think many of us forget or have never been in tune with. Andrew, what you shared, your story of your arc of becoming the spiritually attuned warrior is truly inspirational and life-changing evidently for you but by hearing and witnessing your story we are empowered into our own um, unique journeys of self-healing as well and so i really thank you for that it was powerful to say the least and um, so grateful thank you brother and chief phil it is always such an honor to be with you and I'm just so grateful for you and all of the work that you are doing in the world so that we can remember that bridging is the most important goal. It's not about these polarities and the divisions. The more we can bridge, the more we can truly um, embody peace. And we do, when we go to heart levels, when we go to spirit levels, I fully believe that we are all connected and that there is more that connects us than divides. So through your incredible doorway of sharing, I always remember that message that there is more that connects us than divides and you take us there. So thank you so much, Chief Phil. Thank you. And I thought, what is the song to close with today? And I actually feel that this piece, which I wrote for um, David Gershon's Peace on Earth by 2030 Game, um, would be a perfect, perfect theme song for today's conversation. It's called Welcome to the Golden Age. Okay, so as we're tuning in, just feel gratitude for everything that's been shared today. Acknowledge the growth within your own system and um, Let's just open our hearts to further possibility, further potential for connection and healing in our own lives and on a planetary scale. Infinite love, infinite gratitude. Welcome to the golden age. Frequency our DNA Anchored in our will to shine With peace on earth our guiding light Our initiation has begun So close your eyes, heartbeat as one We 
love you scott it's always such a pleasure to weave with you uh, such a dear soul and you talk about opening up and being a vehicle of peace and love for so many and awareness i love that you it's not just peace and love in this kind of uh floaty sense you call in authentic levels of honest peace and love that has kind of a full spectrum experience an expression of the human story of the human journey. So thank you for having the courage to do that. Thank you, my beloved Earth Angel. And big love to all the Earth Angels and all the warrior angels out there. May we all come into greater compassionate understanding of each other through these programs, 
through hearing stories from Phil and Andrew and all of you. Um, beautiful comments today. Of course, I look forward to seeing all of you next week. We've got wonderful shows. And of course, on Saturday night, February 4th, part two of what we started today. Have a beautiful week, everybody. And remember, you can make any moment sacred by choosing to see the divinity. I'm going to go to gallery view and uh, we can all say and wave goodbye. Take care, everybody. Love you, family. <laughs>